Mm-hmm. Why you wanna play these games on me? Why you wanna play these games on me? Hey, good morning, good afternoon, y'all. Listen to this. I really want to read this article called Juris, uh, Jurisprudence um, by Nicole Lewis. Actually, I'm sorry. The name of the article is Why Are the McMichaels So Scared? Fear is more than just a way to argue self-defense. It's the racist dog whistle that's been present throughout that trial, okay, and this is just a overview or um, what has happened. Uh, I thought this was a very well written article, and I wanted to share it with you guys. Um, it says, uh, when the defense for the three white men accused of murdering 25 year old uh, Ahmad Aubrey. While he was out on a jog last year, rested his case. The jury heard a remarkable. The jury had heard remarkably little about uh, the way race may have informed or motivated Aubrey's killing. The defense team went through great lengths to depoliticize the trial and to minimize any suggestion that Gregory and Travis McMichael or that William Bryan acted on racial animus against Aubrey, who was black. The prosecution, for its part, has shied away from suggesting that bigotry may have played a part in the shooting as well, possibly because such an argument would not be favorable with the all-white jury. Well, y'all got to remember, this is all about strategy, okay? Okay? Um, it's very important that we recognize, although you can recognize uh, when somebody um, should be indicted, when you feel like the whole race is being indicted, um, sometimes, you know, that could have an adverse effect. So you don't want to do overkill. So there's just one problem with this approach. Besides the fact that the defendants are also charged with a federal hate crime. So that's going to cover, really. Um, it doesn't work. Even with or without overt discussion of race over 10 days of testimony, the overwhelming whiteness and maleness of the defendants has been on full display. Consider the defense's main argument. That the defendants acted in self-defense. It hinges on the jury's understanding of a perceived threat. A series of perceived threats. Threats that only surfaced after the defendants attempted to arrest Arbery for trespassing. I knew that he was on me. I knew that I was losing this. I, I, I knew he was overpowering me. Travis McMichael said, if he would have got the shotgun from me, then it was life or death situation. And I'm going to have to stop him from doing this. So I shoot. I shot. On the surface, his comments seem race neutral. But his testimony highlights a commonly used defense of perpetrators against violence turned against unarmed black people. Fear. Never mind that McMichael and his father ran Arbery down with their truck. Never mind that they were the only ones armed. Never mind that Arbery was outnumbered three to one. Never mind that he had been running for miles before the altercation. Never mind that the defendants went looking for a goddamn confrontation. Never mind all that shit. Never mind all of it. It was Mick Michael who found himself in a life or death situation that required him to make a swift, irrevocable action. 
despite his testifying that he had been trained to de-escalation tactics. Um, and that's another thing. I think he came across as very arrogant. Um, in fact, he, he did. He came across very arrogant. Uh, no. A couple times I could tell that he was uh, agitated that the prosecutor, um, Ms. Donikowski, was was uh, tagging his butt. And he didn't like it. And a couple times you could hear his arrogance, white maleness, oppressive. As you can see it popping up right there on the screen. But let me continue. McMichael's words are reminiscent of a past testimony from white men who also claim to be incredibly scared of the unarmed person that they stalked, shot, and killed. The testimony echoes that of Darren Wilson. The damn police officer. Y'all remember him? Darren Wilson? He shot and killed Michael Brown in 2014 when he, on the witness stand, described feeling like a five-year-old holding on to Hulk Hogan. That's how big he felt and how small I felt just from grasping his arm, he said. <laughs> It echoes that of George Zimmerman, who shot and killed Trayvon Martin in 2012, when Zimmerman said he was he he just feared for his life after pursuing that child. Fearing of being overpowered powered by Arbery isn't even the only racist dog whistle in the case. The coverage of the initial shooting, nearly every media outlet parroted the McMichael's claim that they pursued Aubrey out of concern over rising crime in the neighborhood, in particular a series of break-ins. But in a court last week, those claims fell completely apart. The prosecutor, Linda Dunikowski, pointed out that all the 911 calls that, uh, made in 2019, only one was for burglary. And ultimately, that turned out to be a false alarm. How about that? Dunikowski then asked Travis McMichael how he learned about the crime in the neighborhood, to which he replied, <laughs> he learned from Facebook and his mother. He learned from Facebook and he mommy. Wow, wow, wow. Think about that for a minute. You know, they said from the very beginning, the defendants claimed the narrative upper hand by tapping into the easily accepted fear for white Americans everywhere. And the national media helped him to do it. I thank God for fair, fair-minded, open-minded human beings that knew with that overwhelming evidence and what they had watched on those videotapes deemed that they had to come back. They had to actually come back with a guilty verdict. When they saw all this craziness that these guys had done, they had no other alternative. I mean, they, I, you know, so again, you know, I appreciated every thought and every fair-minded individual. The testimony also highlights a crucial privilege of whiteness and maleness, always being given the benefit of the doubt. Because for months before they were even indicted, the defendants got to go and spread their version of the story, and the media published their claims over and over without even questioning, fact-checking, or even offering a counter-narrative to what had happened that day. 
Okay? Decades of research have shown that media outlets over inside crime coverage causing many Americans to believe crime rates are higher than they actually are. Once again, Travis McMichael testimony appears race neutral on the surface, but is actually laden with racial implementations implications, I'm sorry. From the be very beginning, the defendants claimed the narrative upper hand by tapping into an easily accepted fear for white Americans everywhere. And the national media helped them do it. These initial fears have given away to new ones as the trial uh, came to a close. Lawyers for the defendants appear threatened by black pastors present in the courtroom. They've asked the judge <laughs> to bar any more black pastors from coming up in here and to not allow additional high profile members of the African American community to sit in on the trial. When Reverend Al Sharpton joined Aubrey's family in court, defense attorney Kevin Gull called Sharpton's presence intimidating. He also confused Sharpton for the Reverend Jesse Jackson who had not even come to Brunswick, Georgia yet. Here, the defense positioned the black pastor's presence as yet, what, another perceived threat. I mean, look at these weak-ass people. I mean, this is just, oof. And the, and the play for the, the placate for that type of uh, white a mindset with white people is a tragedy. It's a tragedy. <laughs> this was so crazy. These initial fears have given away the new ones. As the trial winds to a close, it's already closed, of course. And the guy said he didn't want any more black pastors in here. Remember? He also confused Sharpton for the Reverend Jesse Jackson, who had not even come to Brunswick, Georgia. <laughs> I'm sorry. Here the defense positions the black pastor's presence at yet, what? Another perceived threat requiring swift and forceful responses. You know, despite attempting to sanitize the case from any semblance of history, Gall shows he is actually aware of the case's racial overtones. He was worried that Sharpton's presence was an attempt to pressure, could be consciously or unconsciously an attempt to pressure and influence the jury. Is he concerned the jury will make meaning out of the fact that Sharpton is a civil rights icon? That the jury might see Sharpton as another black pastor Provided comfort and counseling to Aubrey's grieving parents. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe it's the fact that Sharpton called Aubrey a, a killing a lynching in the twenty first century. No matter what the answer is, it is clear that despite Gold cloaking his comments as a well meaning attempt to ensure his clients receive a fair trial. He is aware of the case's connections to a long history of, of, of black pastors comforting victims of racial violence. He, he's well aware of that. Well, ultimately, Judge, you know, he the judge was unpersuaded by his request. And, of course, um, he denied it. So, even after the judge... Uh, Rebuked the defense for these statements, calling them reprehensible. The defense team petitioned him to declare a mistrial after Aubrey's mother broke down and wept in the gallery. The defense claimed that the jury might be unduly influenced by such displays of emotion. Once the crying began, jurors were ushered out of the room. Gough and his team treated Wanda Cooper-Jones' tears 
as so potently devastating to their case that the whole trial needed to be thrown out because she cried. It is worth asking why the defense would be so alarmed by this display of emotion. Perhaps it has something to do with the motion that they filed to prevent the prosecution from calling Arbery a victim, like they did here. Which they say unfairly suggests that their client's guilt. The, the motion was denied, but a sweeping mother crying over the loss of her son sends a visceral and powerful signal to the jury about who was really harmed here. I mean, sometimes you have to do that. They had, you know, who's really harmed? And everything, this guy walks into there, he goes, Your Honor, somebody's breathing real heavy back there in the back. Uh, can you declare a mistrial, please? <laughs> That's all I've heard from Gough. Gough, whatever his name is. Gough. Gough. Think about that. He's so intimidated by her tears and her son has been murdered. The defense also thinks that there's only enough space for one set of emotions in this trial. The only emotion that matters here is their client's overwhelming fear for their lives, which was precipitated by the fear of a crime in their neighborhood. Their defense positions the McMichaels and Bryant as both victims and defenders. They were threatened by rising crime, so they went out and defended the neighborhood. They were threatened by Aubrey, so they had to kill him. They were threatened by black pastors, so they tried to bar them from the court. They are threatened by Aubrey's mom's tears, so they asked for a mistrial. <laughs> you know what? But this focus on the defendant's fears only highlights the defense callousness to our pain. Imagine what it must have felt like for Aubrey as McMichael was closing in on him with their fucking truck clad in a confederate Freaking license plate with the elder McMichael clutching his handgun in the flatbed. Imagine how tired and scared Aubrey must have been after running for his damn life. Imagine what he must have felt the moment he realized he could no longer outrun his killers. Imagine what it was like. And Imagine what it must have felt like, nearly dead and bleeding in the street, as the young man Michael stands over and yells, fucking nigger. Aubrey was the one that was terrified. But his fear somehow don't even matter. It no longer even counts. It was about their fear. Complete madness. Rest in power, brother Aubrey. Rest in power. You gonna go down in the books now as another sacrifice. You in the realm in the realm of an ancestor of an ancestor, and uh, another one in our long struggle for freedom, justice, and equality in this country. May God bless and keep your family. 